And now on Monday Weekend Television, Gene Hackman talks about his films in this week's edition of The South Bank Show. film opens in London this Thursday called Eureka. It was made by the British director Nick Rogue. It stars Gene Hackman, who's the subject of tonight's programme. Gene Hackman has been one of the cinema's most respected character actors since his Oscar-winning portrayal of New York Detective in The French Connection. He achieved success at a time when the anti-hero gave a new realism to films. Actors such as Dustin Hoffman, Jack Nicholson, Robert De Niro and Hackman himself have developed a style of acting that can be traced back to Marlon Brando, a style which lays emphasis on realistic character portrayal achieved by the actor searching for things in himself which he has in common with the character he's playing. As Hackman puts it, internalising. In tonight's programme, he talks about his approach to various roles to our director, Alan Benson. In Eureka, Hackman plays Jack McCann. Having prospected in the Yukon for 15 years, McCann discovers gold and achieves almost limitless wealth. As a result of this, his life and relationships deteriorate. In this scene, with his wife, played by Jane Lapater, McCann begins to articulate his depression about his crumbling world. Do you know what eternity looks like? It's white and yet very dark. Desert of snow at night. Now I've reached the edge of eternity and beyond eternity. said to me the other day about my not being able to see. You're so damn right, I can't see and I can't hear. I'm paralyzed. Once I had it all, now I just have everything. Actors are funny about their contribution. You, you may not hear but one or two words of what a director says in terms of what he wants from you. And in years to pass, those words you will rem remember possibly, but the rest of all the, the months of, of digging and, and manipulation, you tend to forget and you think, well, of course, I, I invented that. I mean, I, that, is, that is my character. And that's maybe as it should be, because the nature of, of the actor is one of bringing a certain uh, presence, ambiance, to the, to the set to, to, to do his work. I look at a character and I, I, the first two questions I ask myself is, how am I like this person? How, how am I unlike this person? It seems very obvious kind of question to ask yourself about a character. Uh, but it, if you really start looking into those two questions in relationship to almost any character you play, you find a great many answers, and you needn't go out and uh, uh, externalize uh, from people you see on the street necessarily. I do that also, but I, I tend to do it almost all internally. Much of the filming for Eureka took place in Jamaica. It was there we spoke to Gene Hackman and watched him at work on the set. 
Hackman's been making films for almost 20 years. It's a process about which he has few illusions now, but as a boy, it seemed a glamorous and seductive business. When I was a kid, I used to go to the Saturday afternoon films and the serials and all that, and I was very taken with many of the actors of that, that era. And I was very stunned afterwards that I was not, in fact, that actor, that, that character, that person, that I would come out of the theater and look in the mirror in the lobby of the theater and see this little short guy there who didn't look anything like Errol Flynn. And yet I felt, watching him, that I could do all that. I really felt that I could, and uh, as it turns out, I couldn't. I mean, I'm just not that kind of, of actor, but that was my early thoughts about um, about acting was watching terribly care carefully the behavior of actors if they made it real by the way they handled things about the way they in small ways I don't know why Errol Flynn seemed to, to stick in my my mind I suppose because at that time he was the epitome of the kind of energetic actor who was still in a way uh, for me at least, quite real. Although he'd played a number of strong supporting roles, Hackman didn't get his big break until 1971, when he starred in The French Connection as the tough, drug-busting detective Popeye Doyle. I wanted desperately to do it. It was a good script and it was uh, a leading role. and It would have been my first starring role. At that time, I had played a couple of cops. I had done your average plumber, kind of every man. So in, the, in that respect, I suppose I was cast a tie, but it was a very tough role for me. I had never been in film, I had never been that, that violent, that really direct and that forward. <laughs> Prior to uh, the, the start of the film, I had been out with the, the two real policemen who were involved in the, in the French Connection case. And we had gone into what they call shooting galleries in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant. Where, so I had had some kind of indoctrination to being around people who were involved in drugs uh, a month or so at night, you know, on the town, as it were. So when we got to the scene in the bar and rehearsed it on this Sunday, I felt that I could, I could probably do it all right because I had seen him do, he actually did something like that in a bar where he came in and, and that was fairly frightening. So the Monday morning when we were to start this scene, when I showed up, it was a sea of black faces and all looking very, very bad, <laughs> I'll tell you. <laughs> so we started in. And Sonny Grasso was really enjoying it because he could see how uncomfortable I was. And he finally started to introduce me. And he said, this is Sergeant blah, blah, the 92nd, and this is Lieutenant. And it turned out that they were all policemen. And uh, they were all very sympathetic to what we were doing. It made it a lot easier, I'll tell you. But I don't, I don't think to... to just to go back to the, the earlier premise, that I don't think I could have done that as well if they hadn't been wanted me to do it. What's my name? Doyle. What? Mr. Doyle. Come here. You pick your feet. Do you get over there. Get the hands on your head. Hold oh, up. We told you people were coming back. We're going to keep coming back here until you clean this bar up. Keep your eye on your neighbor. If he drops something that belongs to you. What is this, a fucking hospital here? Huh? Turn around there, fella. What do we got here, huh? This belong to you? Huh? Stand up there, naughty. Get your hands on your fucking head. Get in there! You want to take a ride there, fat man? Oh, bullshit. Uh, several days into the filming, uh, I think the second or third day, we were, we were filming in a, in a car where we had captured that particular character that we were running after. And I had to slap him. And it was very tough for me to do. I, I, I could slap him once, but five or six times became 
it was, you know, it, was, it wasn't the actor. The actor said, go ahead, you know, lay it on me. But it was very difficult for me to do. And I could sense that the director, Billy Freakin, was becoming annoyed, to put it mildly, that I wasn't able to, to really let, let go. Um, I talked to him after that, that evening sh uh, shooting when we, when we shut down. I said, hey, maybe you better replace me because I, I'm having a tough time with this. I really was. And I was, I was scared at that point because the enormity of having a major production on my shoulders at that, at that time in my career and, and feeling that I wasn't able to do it uh, was... It was unbalancing for me. I really was frightened. So he set the scene aside, and we got into other kind of lighter things. And there was a, there was a moment, two, two days after that, we were shooting nights, actually, and in a parking lot or whatever, and I kind of made a flippant kind of uh, movement with something I had in my hand. Oh, it's a, a Danish pastry or something. And at that moment, I recall quite vividly that I felt that that was as much of a kernel of an idea for the character as I could come up with at the time. Now that seems like a very vague kind of small thing to hang your hat on, literally, for the character, but it worked for me. I, I saw in that some way to then make the character strong and flippant and, went, and I then went on. <laughs> No, no, man, no. Hey, no. Is it Joe the Barber? Huh? Joe the Barber, right? No. That's who it is, isn't it? Now, don't give us any shit. What's Joe's last name? I don't know, man. Give it, give it, give it. Yeah, I know he lives on 125th Street, man. About the barber shop. What side of the street do you live on? Huh? North or south? North or south? I don't know what you're talking about, man. I don't know. I'm, I'm asking south. you what side of the street he lives on. Hey, shithead. When was the last time you picked your feet? Huh? Yeah, what's he talking about? I got a man in Poughkeepsie who wants to talk to you tell you a little incident that happened also during that time when we were out with the the police uh, I heard the the real uh, detective Eddie Egan say to um, a pusher at one time in the basement where we had gone uh, he was trying to get him to uh, talk about other people who had involved in drugs and he said to him um, do you pick your feet in Poughkeepsie and um, so, and the director happened to be along with us that night too, and he, he put that into the, the script. But several nights later we were out and we, we saw somebody walking along the street and he said, get in the back seat. And so I did and, and he stopped and he picked up um, a kid who was doing something. I don't remember what he was doing. He was obviously wrong, as they say. And uh, he said, okay, Sergeant. <laughs> and he wanted me to question this kid. And the idea was for me to use some of the dialogue from the film and to see how it worked on a real thing. And so I said to the kid, do you pace your uh, poog in uh, Papas? And uh, I said, no, wait. And he said, what? And I said, do you, do you pick your... Um... I said, Sergeant, uh, okay, let this kid out. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get it out. And the kid was looking at me, didn't know what was going on. It was tough. It was really very hard for me to to uh, to relate to that in a real way. Have you ever been to Poughkeepsie? Huh? Have you ever been to Poughkeepsie? Hey man, come on, give me a break. Hey, hey, I don't know what you're talking about. Let me hear you say it. Come on. Have you ever been to Poughkeepsie? You've been to Poughkeepsie, haven't you? I want to hear it! Come on! Yes, yes, yes I've, I've You've been, been there, right? Yeah, yeah. You sat on the edge of the bed, didn't you? You took off your shoes, put your finger between your toes and picked your feet, didn't you? Now say it! Yes! All right. You yes. put a shoe on my partner. You know what that means? God damn it! All went wrong, I gotta listen to him gripe about his bowling scores. Now, I'm gonna bust your ass for those three bags, and I'm gonna nail you for picking your feet in Poughkeepsie. I don't think I could do it now. I don't think I could, I could uh, get the energy and the, and the, the belief in, the, in that, um, in that character. I, I think I know too much now to, uh, I think part of the w why that worked for me was the, the enthusiasm and the, the, uh, just the utter, uh, 
the sheer drive of me as a character, uh, as an actor at that point in my, my career. Gene Hackman's powerful portrayal of Popeye Doyle won him his first Oscar. Three years later, he won his second as the lonely and enigmatic bugging expert in Francis Coppola's The Conversation. He'd played several strong and different character parts in between those two films, but after The Conversation, he was contractually obliged to play Popeye Doyle again in the sequel to The French Connection. I didn't really want to do the sequel. I felt that, I, that it would be very difficult for me to, at that time to change and to, to give a, a, a new director any kind of uh, leeway in order to expand the character. There, were, there was a couple of scenes in the film which I quite enjoyed, things that I had never been able to do before as an actor. For example? Well, there was a drug withdrawal scene in, a, in the jail, which uh, uh, as an actor was an interesting challenge for me. Uh, the way we did it, and, and, and my choice of, of, of what I felt was important about drug withdrawal. In French Connection 2, Doyle is caught by the drug smugglers and is forcibly given heroin. By the time he escapes, he's an addict. In one particularly powerful scene, he is drying out. I had seen a number of, of documentary films on drug withdrawal, and it wasn't, generally, it wasn't uh, verbalized very much, what, what I saw them doing. Uh, so I had to kind of choose my own way of going, at, going about it. I, I felt that it was indeed pain, and it was a very specific kind of pain for me. Uh, you never saw any baseball, did you? Well, why war was it? Get in your softball. He was a so. Yes, it is. It was. What? It is. I don't know. kind of thing that I kind of miss as an actor. Uh, the taking chances, the, the uh, putting yourself out on the limb. And you keep wanting to get back to it, but then for whatever reasons, uh, it's, it's left kind of easy for you at this point in wherever I am. Hackman may feel disenchanted with filmmaking now, but as a young actor, he was eager to break into movies. He made his first film, Lilith, in 1964. In it, he played a small supporting role opposite rising young star Warren Beatty. It was the start of a long association between the two of them. The character that I played was quite an easy character for me at that time because I was from the Midwest and I was a kind of a bumpkin still, even though I'd been in New York for a while. I wish sometimes I went on the road myself. It's a good life in more ways than one. You have to shout like that, Norman. You know Mother's trying to get some sleep. Well, let's not go into that now. 
How about the coffee? In on you like no, oh, no, you you stay. We want to hear all about you. Lord, tell me you're over the asylum. Is that right, Vince? Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm uh, training to be something they call an occupational therapist. Mm. Is that so? An occupational therapist. Hmm. I bet that's pretty interesting working. It can be. Yeah. Say, but there's some pretty funny stuff going on in a place like that, isn't it? Huh? Hmm? Come think of it, Laura was telling me that your mother used to be a little, uh, have a sense as, a, as an actor sometimes that you are in fact improvising lines when in fact you're not and I think it's very important that actors don't improvise lines as such and until you get, until you've tried every way in the world to do the lines that are written for you because somebody has sat back in a room somewhere and given that a great deal of thought and for you to very cavalierly uh, dismiss them and say I have a better line it generally you can generally, as an audience, spot an improvised line immediately because it, the, generally the actor will, will change his attitude. Uh, there, is, there are many changes that take place uh, when something is improvised. It's not to say some of it isn't good, but uh, it's not always healthy. The association with Warren Beatty was renewed four years later in Bonnie and Clyde when Beatty asked Gene Hackman to play his brother Buck a role for which he was nominated as the best supporting actor. Well, I, I think what I brought to Bonnie and Clyde was a, a great deal of freshness and energy, uh, which we, <laughs> I wish I could find now. But I think that we accomplished in the film some interesting kind of playing together that maybe wasn't really there in the script. And I really mean we, because I think that it was a, a project that, that uh, relied a great deal on on the energy of, of the actors and, and what they brought to it. Hey, listen, it was, it was either you or him, wasn't it? What? The guy that you killed, you had to do it, didn't you? It was either you or him. You put me on the spot. I what? had to. You had to do it, right? I had to. I had to. I, I knew you did. Don't uh, say anything to Blanche about that. No, I... Time you broke out of jail, that true she she talked you into going back. Yeah, and you hear about that? Huh? That true? Yeah, yeah. Well, I won't say nothing to Bonnie about it. <laughs> I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. to me about Bonnie and Clyde was that it seemed like the best possible world to be involved in. Uh, five other actors who were all from New York and all were kind of friendly and, and working in kind of an ensemble feeling for scenes. Now I don't know, I've never talked to any other actors about this, but whether or not they felt that way, but I did. I just thought it was the best thing that ever happened and that films were really going to be great. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that feeling since then. But I don't mean to disparage uh, film acting, but it does seem, well, look at where we are here, a kind of a tropical paradise, and I'm off for the day, and I'm being paid anyway, and. I'll be off for several days probably, and they're out there working away, and I'm here enjoying this, so to speak. Seemingly. Although, to me, it, it's, it's not enjoyable. I would much rather be working. I'd rather be 
and I mean hard at work, really involved in the, in the project, or not at all. But this is not an unusual situation for a film where you, where you in a, you're in a place like this that you can't really enjoy, and there is something going on that you can't get involved in. I, I've, I've recently, in the last year, taken uh, into painting, and I find that if I could do it just a little better, <laughs> that I would feel great confidence. But, but since I can't quite do it as well as I, I feel that it would be necessary for me to, to really chuck everything, there's just that kind of tantalizing area there where I'd say, well, maybe I'd better keep on doing what I'm doing. I don't mean to make money with it, but I mean just to, as a kind of a survival mechanism. Germaline for cuts or grazes, <laughs> spots or pimples, cracks or blisters. Germaline, the cut and graze ointment that treats more than cuts and grazes. At this time of year, we travel agents usually explain that holidays will be dearer this summer. Well, TWA fares to America won't be dearer. Not even the same. TWA fares will be cheaper than last summer. New York, £329 return. That's £56 cheaper. TWA to Los Angeles, £449 return. £85 cheaper. Buy now, and they're fully guaranteed. So, this could be you. Saving money, flying TWA to America. It's all right. Know what I mean? New car, Frank? New camera, Rizzo? Hey, that's the new Canon T50. Automatic load, auto exposure, power drive wind on. Uh, Frank? Canon program uh, two. Frank? Super bright viewfinder. It's got the lot. Uh, Frank, I think you should know. About the interchangeable lenses. Why, it also takes the new speed light flash. This is a big little camera, Rizzo. I like it. It's foolproof. <laughs> it was made for you. You know, I could get carried away with this. It's like your car, huh, Frank? My car? <laughs> the new fully automatic Canon T50. When I pay good money for saucepans, I expect them to last. Don't you? Now, Presti's lifetime is guaranteed to last 10 years. And that means thousands of hours on your cooker and a lot of time in the washing up. That's why only Presti's lifetime have thicker stainless steel bodies, solid copper bottoms, and real teak handles. Excuse me. You can put the dinner on. I'll be home in 20 minutes. For looks that last, it's lifetime. Only from Prestige. Need a color television for the kids, your bedroom, or the kitchen? Don't spend a fortune. Come to SET in Croydon. SET have ex-rental colour televisions from only $39.95, and that includes three months guarantee. So come to SET Windmill Road, Croydon, or phone 689-6889 anytime till midnight. Save £200 on Hub Central Heating and get your first two services free. Nothing to pay till October. Ring 464-6575 now. Jack McCann, the character Gene Hackman plays in Eureka, seems to have everything. 
His life and downfall revolve around the gold that he finds at the beginning of the film. For as his fortunes increase, so his relationships fall apart, and he finds himself driven by devouring jealousy. His obsessive attachment to his daughter, Tracy, crumbles on her marriage to the young playboy, Claude, and it's on Claude that McCann focuses his anger. You didn't earn the gold, Jack. You took it from nature. You raped the earth. I found it. You stole it. What the hell you do, pluck chickens for a living? Stop it, please. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. Tracy in Wonderland. The Mad Hatter's Tea Party. This is it. There's no chocolate inside. Well, you can't undo it, Mr. D'Amato. It's gold. Well, Jack likes to give gold presents after dinner. Tweedledee and Tweedledum. You can't take it with you. What are you doing? It's only gold, Jack. Like all things, it'll pass. And when it does, I'll send it back to you. Tracy, get him out of here. I never want to see him again. No, stop it. Stop it. Whose side are you on, Charlie? Get out of here! Vanish! Tracy, you can't be going, mother. Don't do it to yourself, Jack. Later, the action switches to the son-in-law's house, where the animosity between the two men becomes a physical battle over the girl. I have a scene coming up that uh, where I break in here and confront him with what I think is his real motive in marrying my daughter. Turns out it may be wrong, but it's, uh, it's kind of a very dramatic scene. something that I've done before it it sticks right here I, I, I can't get it out I can't I can't um, I just can't physicalize it I can't verbalize it I can't but I have a kind of a funny mechanism that works for me in that I, I'm not terribly crazy about anything I've ever done so to look back and repeat it would be a really really redundancy um, I find it's more dangerous for me to think in terms of some of the uh, actors who I admire and through the years. And if I get into trouble, uh, my, my general response always is, how would such and such have handled this? 
that's also very fleeting because it, it doesn't mean a lot. I, I have to kind of uh, make a, a, an image of that and that doesn't work either. So I, <laughs> I also I'll go back to square one almost always of asking myself the simple questions of, of how am I like this guy? One never knows what to play for that audience out there, that group of people who will come to see a film with a, with a star attached to it. I think that used to work to a great degree in the old days when the studios developed their stars, developed their actors, and, and <clears throat> kept putting them in vehicles that, that were specifically uh, tailored for them. And now the actors who are able to maintain some kind of image uh, do that for themselves. I, I'm not capable of doing that. I, I, I don't quite know why. I, I, I think it's probably some kind of perverseness in, in me that, that I just feel that I have to, to keep playing things that are interesting to me as an actor to, in order to, not necessarily to grow, that would be kind of highfalutin, but to, to just to find it interesting because there's very little in film that is interesting uh, after you've been doing it for 20 years. Ireland, maybe. But I find it fascinating that, that people do uh, tend to put you in a category that, that finally, through a course of a body of work, I suppose, um, that whoever you are finally comes out in the end. You can't win, really. You can't, you can't always do something so interesting and bizarre uh, that people won't eventually find you out. And by that I mean find out who you are as a person. Um, it would be nice to be able to be that actor who was capable of, of maintaining that, um, that mystique. I, I know of no one that's been, I, I think Brando probably is, has always been my kind of uh, idol, is maybe too strong a word, but certainly my guide to to find film work. And um, finally through the body of his work, I, I think I can see kind of who he is. But that's, it's an interesting phenomenon. In 1975, Gene Hackman made Night Moves, directed by Arthur Penn, who had also directed Bonnie and Clyde. It was a film on which Hackman learned a lesson. There was, a, there was a sequence where we had, we had been shooting at n uh, nights for possibly three weeks, and it's very tough for me, at least, to shoot nights because I have a tough time sleeping in the daytime. And we were very, get, very close to the end of the shooting in Florida, and we were going to move back to, to uh, Hollywood to do some interiors. Uh, we were shooting out, outdoors uh, on a porch of a little cabin at night, and the scene kept m uh, moving indoors. The, the final uh, finality of the scene, scene was going to be uh, the scene in the, on the bed, in the inside. It was a chess game, as I recall, and I could see the way he was, he was manipulating it, that we were going to be inside. And I knew that if we got inside and start shooting the interior, that we were going to be down there another four or five days. And this was one of the last evenings we were to shoot there. And I said to him at one point, Arthur, if you move into this bedroom and start shooting this, this sequence now, I'm gonna walk right off the set. And he looked at me and says, why don't you do that? <laughs> I, I don't know what kind of response I expected from him, but I guess I, I, I wanted him to say to me, don't worry about it, everything's gonna be okay. We're gonna shoot that scene back home because we were all very tired. Uh, but he didn't. He just really threw down the gauntlet and <laughs> said, why don't you do that? And I was really like, I'm stuck with that then. <laughs> what was I going to do? <laughs> so it really kind of taught me a great lesson about if you're going to throw down a, the gauntlet, you've got to be w willing to stand up and, and do whatever you, you feel is uh, right. Of course, I was dead wrong. I was only tired and I was getting kind of bored with it all. Hackman's talent is seen most clearly when he's playing against one other person. In I Never Sang For My Father, he played opposite veteran actor Melvin Douglas. He gave a moving performance as the son, whose relationship with his father is disintegrating. Dad, I, I know this is your home, or what you're used to, but 
Well, I, I'd like you to come out there with me, Dad. It's lovely out there, and we, we can get you an apartment close to us. And... You know, I would like to make a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Why don't you all come here to live? Peggy has her practice out there, Dad. A what? She's a doctor, I told you. And, and she has children, and they have their school and friends. Well, we have a big house here. And you always liked this house. It's wonderful for children. You used to play baseball out back. And then there's that, that, that basketball thing. Dad, I, I'd like to get away from this country for a while. It's been rough here ever since Carol died. It's good for you, too, getting away. Your mother would be very happy to have the house full of children again. I won't be around long, and, and then it's all yours. The only real thing in filmmaking is if and when you are involved in a scene where you can really go at it with another actor, where you can really uh, great interplay and, and the subtleties and innuendo of, of all that, what that implies, is all there is in, in, in the business, really, for me. I'm sorry as hell about your miserable childhood. When I was a kid, you used to tell me those stories. I'd come up to my room at night and I'd cry. But there's nothing I can do about it now. And it does not excuse everything. And I am grateful to you. And I admire you and respect you and stand in awe of what you've done with your life. I'll never even be able to touch it. But it does not make me love you, and I wanted to love you. You hated your father, and I saw what that did to you, and I did not want to hate you. I don't care what you feel about me. Well, I do. I came so close to loving you tonight. I've never felt so open to you. You don't know what it cost me to ask you to come with me. And I've never even been able to sit in the same room alone with you. You really think your door was always open to me? It's not my fault if you never came through it. I was, I was kind of stunned. I was uh, nominated for that, that role and in, as a supporting actor, which was uh, kind of strange to me. Uh, not that I cared, what, you know, it was nice to be nominated, but uh, it, it, it was very peculiar. And the film didn't do well, but uh, to, to get those kind of nominations for a film that did, did nothing, it meant that I suppose that there was somebody out there watching, that there was part of the industry who saw something in that, that film that was worthwhile. Another critically acclaimed but financially unsuccessful film was Scarecrow. Again, Hackman was playing against one other actor, this time Al Pacino. They played two down-and-outs traveling across America. The film traces the development of their friendship. Interesting uh, about Scarecrow is that uh, it was quite an easy role for me. He is a man who institutes a lot of um, action in the film, as opposed to being laid back and, and reacting to it. It's always e easier to, to act than it is to react. Uh, so it was, it was kind of, it was kind of easy for me. We, we had the interesting experience before the film that Al and I, uh, were in San Francisco, uh, and we, we decided in order to get the ambiance of two guys who were really kind of on the, uh, on the bum, uh, we bought some old clothes at the Salvation Army and kind of walked around Market Street for several days, but we met a man who uh, we stopped one day to, to ask where the Salvation Army soup kitchen was. And uh, he gave us directions down Market Street, two blocks and to your right, and then, and then you see down this little alleyway, and aren't you Gene Hackman, he said. <laughs> must have been. And he, that's all he said. I said, yeah. And we walked on, and he must have thought going to the soup kitchen. He and this other fellow, he probably recognized Al, too. Uh, that's always kind of fun for an actor, to be able to go out and do that kind of uh, research on, on a character. And whether or not you subliminally pick up things, and I think that's probably more to the point, uh, that you do tend to uh, pick up things from being around that, that, you, that may not be specific, like they were in French Connection, the, 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 where I saw the actual character do certain things. Um, I think just the, the, the physical 
side of the of the character, putting on the, the layered clothing, and it gave me more of an idea of who he was. Hey, 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 hey. Have fun. Come on. Hey. Come on. Hey. Hey. In this scene, Pacino is about to walk out on Hackman, and to win him back, Hackman does an impromptu and uncharacteristic striptease in a crowded bar. Well, it was a it was a scene that was was scripted, and it was I I had some some fear of it because uh, I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I had no idea of uh, what really to, how far that that character would go out of character when it seemed, and it seemed to be, when you read that, that that was a totally out of character uh, move for him to do. But many times when things are out of character, if you can make them work in terms of the behavior, if the behavior is right, and then, then they work tremendously well because it's a human response to, to what is going on in the scene. And what he was trying to do, of course, in that scene was get the other character to come out of his um, kind of depression. And for him to do that showed great love, where he was willing to put what he thought as his persona aside and be able to do something that was outlandish for another human being. <laughs> films we've talked about so far have been successful. You've made bad films. <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> no, it's true. Um, I've made a number of films that I, I wish I hadn't. Um, Cisco Pike, Prime Cut, and Doctor's Wives. During that era when, when really I felt that that was like my off-Broadway period that I was uh, kind of stumbling around uh, making a living. And it seemed okay at the time. And it's one of the reasons I guess I, I stopped working after Superman. That I, not that Superman was bad, but that I had looked at what I was doing at that point. And I was simply uh, accepting roles on, on the monetary value involved. Uh, I, I think you can only do that for so long, it catches up with you. Superman was one of the most financially successful films ever made. In it, Gene Hackman played the comic villain Lex Luthor. It was a new kind of role for him, and one he found difficult. It's hard playing a kind of a, a cartoon character, uh, and try to be really straight-faced when you look at this man that you're playing a scene with, and he has this funny outfit on, you know. Um, but it works. It works on a, on a level for uh, certain audiences, and uh, it was somewhat interesting at the time to do it. It was a different kind of a challenge. I, I don't regret having done that at all. I think I probably would have if it hadn't worked, if it hadn't been financially successful. Then, then you have to say you did it for whatever reasons, and you stole the money. But. It, I guess as long as they got their money back, then I felt kind of honest about my endeavor. As well as playing a very different character, Hackman also had to cope with the problems of makeup and costume changes. After so many years in the film business, he still hasn't come to terms with all the physical problems of filmmaking. Yeah, I have a, uh, a problem about that because I like to, as an actor, be able to touch myself, to, you know, to go like this or whatever. And when I feel inhibited in that area, uh, I try very, very hard to be as, as loose as I can as a human being, so as an actor I can then relate. I, I did wear a ball cap in, the, in some scenes, and then I 
teased my hair up to make it look as if it was a wig in other places, but it wasn't really as honest uh, as I could have been for the kind of money that they were paying me. And I really, that was one of the reasons why I really decided to stop work for a while, because I felt that I uh, was getting to the point where I had too much to say about uh, those kinds of things. And it was really power more you than it was. You were becoming a star. Yeah. And I didn't like that I, in, my, in myself. I felt that, that that was detrimental to what I felt I could do as an actor. And I, I think maybe that's what's wrong with film, is that, that the actor maybe has too much to say as an actor. Uh, they get into uh, the area of producing, directing, without really having the title or the, or the wherewithal to do that. But it's an interesting kind of phenomenon to me because I find that after having been involved in films for some 20 years, that you know a little about it. And you get a sense of what will work and what, what doesn't work. And it's very hard to keep your mouth shut. Really, that's what it boils down to, especially if you're bored. Uh, it's, it's much easier to say, oh, excuse me, you, could we try such and such? Or, could we go this way? And, and if you do that in front of a whole crew and a director is, has any kind of problems about security at all, he is going to feel emasculated in, in some way. And you've then kind of made some kind of permanent imprint on what's going to happen in the rest of the film. But it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, interesting and kind of maybe unanswerable question. In Did you terms back of away from movies because you sensed you were becoming difficult to work with? Yeah. I am difficult to work with and uh, I want to make sure that that difficulty comes out of artistic decisions as opposed to to j power decisions and, and uh, things that are ugly to me in the business. I don't think so. I, I think I would always be involved either in the theater or in, in film because it's all I know, really. But um, I think I've kind of exorcised the, the need to uh, be a performer. Although that's not to say that I, I don't have aspirations still. But I think you, you can grow out of it. Uh, whether I will or not, I don't know. Go ahead. Almost every day I, on, the, on the set, I would um, ask myself, and in the, especially if I'm involved in some kind of uh, ridiculous costume or, or having to wear some kind of strange makeup or drenched in blood or whatever. And I look at that and I say, uh, is this what a grown man does at 50 odd years old, 52? I, I can't come up with an answer to that. I can't, I can't say, yes, this, this is acting profession is certainly an um, admired and an honorable thing to do. I suppose it is, but I'm, I, I keep questioning it. And maybe that's why I'm still an actor. Maybe that's why I can do it, is because there is still a small boy in me who likes to dress up. But it's strange, it's very strange. I suppose at 70 years old, you, you come to the realization that it all doesn't matter so much, that it's as good as any profession. But I still haven't come to grips with it. Gene Hackman, we'll be back next week. Good night.